so thank you everyone for uh, for being here. This has been um, I, I came to this event last year for the first time and I loved it and really enjoyed what Jalapa and the and the team have put together. So uh, I when when she when the opportunity came up this year, I, I jumped at it and. Uh, you know, as, as she mentioned, I'm one of the people that built Money 2020. Um, you know, it was four of us, you know, calling our friends in a room, and we built it to what it is. And um, so it, it's a fintech conference, and we had like 14,000 people in Vegas last year. We had about 9,000 people in, in Amsterdam. So it, it's like the stuff that we're talking about here is very, very important and relevant around the world. And so that's why I'm really excited to have uh, all of our panelists here today. Um, and, and as well as Kelvin um, online. So I, I, I actually like, I wanted to ask everyone to maybe give a quick two minute introduction about themselves and then I'll, I'll, I'll give an introduction at the end and then we'll, we'll start with the, with the session, if that makes sense. So actually Linda, why don't you start off? Thank you so much for our having me here today. And Jalapa, thank you so much for inviting me back. Um, I'm Linda Jang. I am the head of Global Web3 Strategy at the Crypto Council for Innovation. I'm also a visiting scholar at Georgetown Law. And uh, I have been uh, a regulator for probably most of my career. So it's really great to see so many of my old colleagues from the Fed um, and the Financial Stability Board as well. So thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, and thanks for having me. Thanks, Jalapa, for, for inviting us. Um, I work for a company called Treasury Prime. My name is Mark Vermeersh. We make software for banks. That uh, It's an API platform that facilitates bank and fintech partnerships. Um, as part of that, uh, working for Treasury Prime, I run the product and partnerships team um, for that company. Um, we have a network of 15 banks that are on our platform and 75 fintechs and embedded finance companies. Um, in past lives, I worked for a fintech company, a firm in the point of sale lending space, um, where I did similar stuff, product, partnerships. Um, before a firm, I ran the API banking platform for Silicon Valley Bank, uh, which has a very different tone and ring to it today than it did six to 12 months ago. Um, and if you wrap a pretty bow around those those three disparate experiences, it's all focused on the same problem. Uh, the U.S. banking system and economy is great. Um, its banking technology is arcane and legacy, I think, largely because it's one of the earliest economies to digitize and earliest banking systems to digitize. In our <clears throat> and um, our belief in what we're trying to do at Treasury Prime is put... Um, tools in the hands of developers so that they can build great things with their bank partners. Let me join in thanking the organizers, Jalapa, for inviting back. It's always great to be part of this event. Um, my name is Hannah Halaburda. I'm Associate Professor of Technology at Stern, uh, New York University Stern Business School. Um, I have been researching um, blockchain um, since 2011, so before it was actually blockchain, it was first only Bitcoin, only altcoins, and as technology developed, uh, I was following it and I found it fascinating. And um, not only like before joining Stern, I was at the Central Bank of Canada, I was at HBS, and uh, this research interest has been following me, and actually I've been following it. So uh, uh, and it turns out to be very, very relevant to so many different aspects and the different angles are growing. So um, I'm happy to be part of here. And thank you, Anna. Uh, Kelvin? Hi. Uh, thank you, Jalapa, for inviting me. I'm sorry I can't join you all in person. Uh, it's rather a long flight to Philadelphia and I have classes. <laughs> so uh, I'm a professor of law at the National University of Singapore. Uh, I specialize primarily in property law. And I used to research uh, land registration. So I've been interested in ledgers before the blockchain was a thing. Uh, I got interested in Bitcoin and how legal systems could fit Bitcoin within its law of property. And then from there branched out to all other aspects of the blockchain, including tokenization. Thank you, Calvin. And um, my name is Sanjeev Kalida. As, as Jalapa mentioned, I'm the wizard at Money 2020. 
Um, I, I, I actually, like the first panelist said, I, I started off in technology. I helped start up Intel's graphics chip business in 1995. And then I actually designed a programming language that, that's still in use all, all these years later. I, I worked at Citibank, managed one of the largest credit card portfolios there. And then uh, I've been doing a startup since 2010. Uh, actually, if I go back to April 1st of 2012, April 1st, I got engaged. Um, April, April 2nd, uh, Google, Google acquired the startup I was working for, TXVIA, because we were the technology behind Google Wallet. Then, um, then April 13th, I was buying an apartment in Manhattan. And then April 29th was our wedding date because my mom was sick, so we just wanted to get everything done very quickly. So crazy month of April, I was buying an apartment with cash, and uh, they, it was a co-op, so they pulled my credit report. According to the credit report, I was married to a man in California, I had five foreclosures, four about auto loans. So the first conversation was with my now wife, like, hey, honey, I'm not married to a man in California. We could still get married. Uh, and then I had to get all that data, other data cleared up. And, and so... That, that to me was a, a bit of um, the personal uh, problems with having a very centralized database. So I, I, I think since then I've, I've been very, um, I, I would say, pro um, uh, l looking at ways of uh, decentralizing data to see if we can change the models that, that are in, in place at the moment. So um, the, the, the first question that I, I'm going to ask each of the panelists is on a scale of one to five, you know, what is your view on like how how much will how much value um, will DeFi create in in finance? Uh, one being no value, five being you know a, a ton of value or you know megatons of value. Um, so if I, if I had to answer that, I'd, I'd probably say four, just because of my background. How, how about you, Linda? So I, it looks like I, I'm the probably one representative uh, from the uh, crypto industry here on this panel. So uh, obviously uh, I uh, believe very strongly in the promise of DeFi and the benefits that it can bring. So I really, but it depends on how we design it. It depends on the regulatory framework. And having been a regulator for 15 years, I strongly believe in the role regulation can play in putting in the guardrails that Vice Chair Barr had just mentioned earlier. But then once you put in the guardrails, you can allow DeFi to flourish. But the question is what those guardrails should be. So I have to say, you know, if it's DeFi the way that I envision it with the proper guardrails along the lines of a white paper that we are currently preparing at CCI and we are going to be putting out shortly and I'd be happy to talk about it later, then I strongly believe it's a five. But it doesn't mean that everyone has to use DeFi. It's just that it's an option. You can participate directly in the financial services and even have a participation stake in that financial service. Be engaged in P2P transactions of your choice. But you can also use banks and uh, crypto exchanges and other intermediaries. So it's just, to me, it's an optionality that could be very powerful. Mark? Yeah, to me, it's a, it's a time question. Um, I think in the short term, I'm a one, um, maybe a two. Um, there's just a lot of innovation in the sector and a lot of controls that need to be put in place in order to ensure safety for the participants in decentralized finance. But technologists are very creative. Um, you know, over the long arc of history, the right controls and protections will be put into place. And I believe that, you know, if you fast forward 10 or 20 years, which is a long time, um, you'll see a lot more value realized from decentralized finance as some of the right um, protections, capabilities, interactions with the traditional finance system are put into place. And so over the long term, I'm probably a four or a five. So I, I agree that there is a timing issue. So in the short term, I would say two. Uh, in the long term, we don't know. Uh, maybe it may shoot up to four, but I'm 
a little bit more skeptical. So I need to explain why I'm more skeptical. I see DeFi and traditional finance as two different worlds. And uh, there is a connection in the sense that DeFi is providing another asset class to invest their returns. And of course, if you invest, it becomes a financial instrument. So yes, there is connection. But when it comes to connecting systems, the way we have DeFi now based on permissionless blockchains, uh, it is unlikely or impossible to really be connected to traditional finance. So it's separate. And therefore, it may inspire uh, the traditional finance to maybe do a little bit more automation by observing what's going on in the uh, in DeFi and maybe provide new instruments, but not, it would be inspiration rather than direct connection. So uh, yeah, then DeFi is going to provide uh, value to financial system as you know, new asset class, uh, asset classes, Picasso market and wine uh, investment or video games. Kelvin? Okay, so I'm a one. And okay. I'm not optimistic even in the medium or long term. I think uh, we've had quite a number of years already since the Bitcoin blockchain came about. Uh, I think that the blockchain is a fundamentally flawed idea, at least permissionless blockchains. Uh, when we talk about blockchain security, what uh, the industry is really talking about is uh, exposed ledger immutability. And that's just a very narrow focus of security. Anyone who actually studies uh, systemic cybersecurity realizes that it's the end user that is often targeted. I've been teaching property law for 20 years. It doesn't really matter whether you're looking at land registers or bank reg ledgers. Uh, nobody targets the ledger. Everybody targets the end user. And at this point, immutability in the blockchain actually hinders us from protecting the end user. Because you can't freeze transactions, you can't reverse transactions. Uh, it's a nightmare uh, if you want to scale this to the mass public. Now, uh, can you add some millions of privileges to add a freeze and reverse transactions? Yes, you could, but then if you're doing that, then what's the point? Back to centralized systems. And I think decentralization is also not a technological problem. So a lot of the systems that we have, if you look at shareholdings, why is it so intermediated? Uh, in, in many countries, the shareholding structure was never designed to have so many layers of intermediaries. The, the intermediaries simply found a way to service market demand. So it, it's not about underlying technology. It's about you know what users want. And users seem to decide saying they want decentralization. Uh, they like the services that intermediaries provide. Okay. So I, I think, Linda, the, you're... You, the, 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 you have a hard task ahead of you. Uh, <laughs> let, 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 just to go through the numbers, uh, you, you, you were a five. Uh, Hannah and Mark, um, I think uh, one or two. Uh, Hannah was a two, um, and Kelvin was a one. So it's it's. I I I feel sorry for you. <laughs> well, let's let's take a bet now. And talk again in ten years. <laughs> uh, I, um, if you zoom out, we are in a really important inflection point where we're about to become a fully digitized economy. So this digital economy has been really driven by the advent of the internet, and the internet has driven decentralization in all sectors of our economy. And DeFi is just one part of a larger decentralization movement. So we're going to eventually see decentralized Twitter, X, you know, decentralized uh, Facebook. Um, technologists are actually working on that now. Uh, Noster is a really good example. And DeFi is just only actually a subset of this broader change driven by the internet. And so in the white paper that we're, we prepared here at, at CCI is that you got to look at the activities of DeFi. Is it the same as TradFi? Yes, but then examine, are the risks the same? And in many cases, the DeFi 
may be providing the same activity but poses different risks. So it may, uh, DeFi lending, for example, requires over collateralization. So that really addresses counterparty credit risks. However, it does introduce new risks, especially operational ones, um, in which includes many technology, um, technological as well as governance uh, risks. So the regulation, therefore, has to be different. But leading to the same outcome, the same regulatory outcome, which is financial stability, safety and soundness, and consumer and customer protection. So how can we help to foster that regulatory outcome? The DeFi protocols should be encouraged to serve as public goods digital infrastructure like the internet. And if they do not, then they should be regulated. And, you know, our members are pro-regulation, but you have to think about how, what kind of guardrails need to be put in place so we can actually be encouraging DeFi protocols to act in our best interests. So uh, I'm happy to go further and talk about more of the policy recommendations in our paper, but uh, this is something that um, I'm really excited to be able to share with uh, my old colleagues um, at the Fed because I really believe in helping to foster the digital economy, which is supported by the digital financial system of the future. So, so, so Mark, um, I, I think Linda brought up some really great points there. Um, and, and I think you're in a unique place having sort of trying to bridge the gap between uh, TradFi and DeFi. Um, like what, what are you seeing in terms of I, either the value propositions that are driving um, maybe traditional folks to look at DeFi or use DeFi, uh, as well as like how do you how are they balancing the risks that you know some of the risks that that Linda just mentioned? Yeah. Um, so for context, um, you know we have this network of 15 banks um, and about 75 fintech or embedded finance partners. Um, some of those fintech partners are, um, uh, you know crypto exchanges or platforms or, you know, trying to do novel things on, on chain. Um, and we serve as the fiat on and off ramp with a couple of our bank partners. And so we really sit at this intersectionality between traditional finance and decentralized finance. And what we're trying to do with, with our technology is make sure that in, in the traditional sense of the world, that the, rules and regulations and governance, governance systems of individual banks are enforced through our API platform. So bad activities are less likely or cannot happen. Um, and what I sit here and think about is like, we're very, very good at doing that. Um, when I look from the perspective of traditional finance and KYC and AML uh, rules and regulations that we're able to enforce, in the API, and I feel great about things, you know, money flowing from banks into decentralized finance. But to me, the interesting thing is, you know, how do you make sure when that, once that value is in a decentralized form, that you know, you know, it's, you kind of lose control because there are so many different protocols and so many different practices from a KYC perspective. You know, globally, the regimes are different, like, and it's just a really, really difficult challenge to think about solving. And I believe in that technologists will figure out a way. It's just going to take a while. Um, um, you know, and global cooperation and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that when decentralized finance protocols interact again with the traditional finance activity, that you know it's coming from good actors as opposed to bad. Um, and, you know, I think fundamentally it's just a really difficult problem to solve and it takes effort and cooperation and intelligent design in a way that keeps consumer protection small business protection mm -hmm. um first and foremost you know as well as you know um vice chair Barr mentioned earlier you know financial inclusion has to be front and foremost at the outset so uh, and and hannah uh, like i think you, you you've probably got the deepest view from a technology perspective. I, I think I was reading that you were looking at like sort of some of the consensus mechanisms and uh, like how they manage, uh, you know, the systems on DeFi, like some, some great points brought up as far as the difficulty, but also the importance of 
managing that? Is, is it a is it a, a lost cause from the get go, or? or <laughs> So the great premise of kind of DeFi and blockchain as kind of the origins of blockchain was the permissionlessness. And this is what's supposed to uh, provide financial inclusion because nobody can exclude you and all this. I find it difficult to see how we can combine permissionless nature of the blockchain with regulation. How are you going to set up know your customer anti-money laundering regulations without gatekeeping access to the to the blockchain. And that I just think is fundamentally uh, inconsistent. Now we can have permission blockchains, right? But then but then a lot of the arguments that were uh, given as the benefit of DeFi are truncated. Right. So, so, so we need to think about the, the, uh, you know, what is, what is the benefit of DeFi? I think there are maybe benefits of DeFi, like I said, opening new, new asset markets. Uh, maybe like I'm looking at the, uh, automated market makers and liquidity pools. The whole idea that individuals may provide piecewise liquidity to the market as opposed to large market makers. I think that may provide some innovative ideas in, in traditional finance. Mm -hmm. Right. So there, there, there are benefits. But when it comes to regulation, right. So a lot of the current benefits of DeFi and high returns, um, is goes back to regulatory arbitrage. Mm -hmm. It's we can go around the regulations. We don't need to have the reserves. We don't need this and that. That's cheaper. And therefore we can have higher returns. If we put the regulation back, well, first of all, some of those returns may go away because regulation is costly. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, but, but also I think it may be, I, I think it's fundamentally impossible to provide it on permissionless blockchain. And therefore it goes against a lot, a lot of the principles of DeFi. Yeah, interesting. And, and, and a great, great point, Sana. And, and Kelvin, um, you, uh, mentally as well as physically are sitting in a different place than us. Uh, pr probably looking at it maybe from a more global view, um, and also additionally, I think you, you know you, you, you're like for example, even thinking about like blockchain for property transfers and things like that. Like it, it needn't be necessarily for money to transfer. So like I, I've heard use cases about that. It, I, I w would love to hear your thoughts about you know the value proposition of blockchain, and you know what might have, you know what, what sort of talked about and 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 as well as what, what is the reality in, in, in terms of what you've seen? So I, I think that one of the problems with the expectation that blockchain is going to bring some incredible value is that people don't actually understand what uh, authoritative ledgers do, right? Uh, there's this misunderstanding that we will solve this ownership problem if only we had a ledger system uh, that recorded ownership and then we all recorded it authoritative value. The problem, of course, with authoritative ledgers is that they don't prevent fraud, right? Well, frauds will still happen. Uh, what they do is they shift losses. In, in most uh, legal systems, the, the starting point whenever you have an instance of a fraud or a theft is you have between what we call the true owner and the bona fide purchaser. And most legal systems, point is to protect the true owner, and then there are certain exceptions which will favor the bona fide purchaser. And what an authoritative ledger system does is it shifts the balance towards the purchaser. And by shifting the balance towards the purchaser, what you're doing is you're lowering transaction costs. You encourage mm -hmm. But that also means you are making ownership brittle, right? Um, a, a French jurist in the 20th, mid 20th century uh, was remarked that uh, people often forget that today's buyer is tomorrow's owner. So you want it to be cheaper to acquire the property. Do you really want it to be cheaper? Because then it becomes easier for you to lose the property, right? And the way we secure the end user uh, in, in most permissionless blockchains is public key cryptography. Now, public cryptography in the 70s, and we've never ever rolled it out for the end and use uh, to safeguard their own private key. And there's a very good reason for that. It's not a suitable system for the end user. It will cause a lot more trouble. So I can't see how this will work. So this dream of tokenizing everything. 
We already fractionalize assets. Uh, we do tokenize them, except we do it in centralized ledgers. They're not authoritative, or at least they're not completely authoritative. We reserve the right in certain circumstances to freeze transactions, reverse transactions, and the legal systems, ledger system will, to a certain extent, permit uh, reversal. It's very difficult to do in a permissionless blockchain. Not impossible. Uh, you can threaten somebody with contempt of court if they don't reverse, you know, make an equal and opposite transaction. But if the person is out of jurisdiction, you can't do anything. If, if the person decides, you know what, I'm quite happy to be in jail, you can't do anything. Um, mm. I, I can't see how this works. Okay. That, uh, thank you, Kelvin. So, so, Linda, I think both Hannah and Calvin just talked a little bit about like permissionless and permission blockchain. Uh, you also mentioned your white paper. Like, it, it, how how did those types of factors fit into what? Like, how you you looked at you know regulation of blockchains or DeFi? Yeah. So, thank you for giving me that opportunity. I actually have a problem with the term decentralized finance. Whenever we say decentralized, I, I think it, it it it's it's a misleading characterization. To me, it's really self managed. Finance, just like decentralized identity is self-managed identity. And a lot of, uh, the, uh, so-called decentralized, uh, services and products that are, um, coming, uh, down the pipeline are all about empowering the user. And why is this important? It's because we're moving into a digital economy and we as Individuals are actually part of this digital economy, and uh, probably because I've worked with Fed economists for too long now, I think of us almost like economic units. But we are actually the economic units generating the data that drives the digital economy, the data economy. And so right now, we really need a legal regime that will help empower us as individuals to be able to control our own data and be, therefore control our own digital assets, which means therefore we should be able to control our own digital wallets. And then if you keep going down this, this line of thinking, that also means if I should be able to control my own digital wallets that contains my digital assets, including my crypto assets, as well as my digital identity assets, I should be able to also control my own finances. I don't have to only do it this way. I can also use intermediaries, but with this whole regime in mind, and then have to look at the digital tech stack. And uh, our paper actually recommends that DeFi protocols, in order for them to be considered public goods protocols, they actually should be built on public, open, permissionless blockchains, because we really believe that the governance is strongest and also the security and resilience is strongest with public permissionless blockchains. You look at Bitcoin, has not been hacked successfully since its inception in 2010. You look at, uh, it, I also did not mention, after I left the Fed, I actually worked at a DeFi digital payments startup. At that time, I didn't even think of it as DeFi. We were just thinking, how can we set up a digital dollar payment system that can allow businesses be able to send money very quickly to each other um, on blockchain. And when we were doing that, we were designing it as a permission to blockchain, but we discovered it was really difficult to to manage the cybersecurity and potential hacking and governance uh, risks and with a permissioned blockchain. And so um, in the end, I came out of that uh, experience strongly believing that there is a very strong role for public permissionless blockchains. That doesn't mean that there is no role for permissioned blockchains. I think there's a lot of uh, important business use cases for that as well. But in terms of having a, a DeFi protocol that then sits on top of the permission blockchain and then on, and for the users to be able to access those DeFi protocols, they have to use the the apps that then sit on top of the DeFi protocols. So you have public permissionless blockchains as layer ones, the DeFi protocols that sit on top, and then the apps that sit on top of the DeFi protocols that are then used by the users at the very top. It's the regulation should really be applying at the apps level because businesses are operating the apps. And that is where regulation should 
uh, have, have, um, application and, uh, there should be liability applied to that layer. And so, uh, that is, uh, hopefully, um, um, when I was listening to you, um, Hannah, talking about that, it, this is where I think people forget. Uh, users use apps to access those DeFi protocols. And those apps are actually operated by businesses. And we really should think about what should that regulatory framework look, look like. I'm, first of all, I w would like to challenge the safety of permissionless blockchains just because we have an example of one Bitcoin that has not been at least documented to have been double spent and hacked. Does not mean that we have, we, that all permissionless public blockchains are safe by their nature because we have a large number of examples of other cryptocurrencies that operate on very similar blockchain structure as Bitcoin that have been double spent, attacked and sometimes multiple times and it actually attacked to out of existence. So the, the nature of the blockchain does not guarantee security. So then, and the other thing is like, well, maybe we get lucky and our permissionless public blockchain will be secure. I mean, it's one equilibrium, but not, not guaranteed. Uh, now the, the other worry that I have, and I would like to understand more is that if you have permissionless blockchain, then you have, you have a De DeFi layer and you did not, um, said whether you envision it as permissionless or permission, and then there is a DApp layer that is permissioned, uh, or at least this is where there's regulation. If you start with permissionless layers, you can have uh, somebody setting up a DApp uh, that where they do not identify themselves. So are you going to say those DApps are illegal, but I don't know where the person setting up this DApp is, is, is staying. We cannot really regulate them. We cannot put them to court and so on. Like once you start with permissionless, I don't know where this regulation can start. Um, and second, then the DApps that are uh, reg that that are set up by companies that would need to register, then this goes away from the decentralization, right? So, so like, how do you reconcile the, all those elements? Yeah. So, thank you for that question. DApps, uh, decentralized apps. Uh, just want to clarify for everyone, they're not decentralized. Um, they are, they are apps um, that uh, are. Um, uh, uh, developed and maintained by, by companies. This is where the regulation should apply. And so if we don't know who has set up the D apps, then that, you know, I'm looking to the regulators here, you know, when you consider building that framework, uh, I would recommend that that probably should not be permitted. This is the app layer that then sits on top of the DeFi protocol layer. And DeFi protocols can be designed in different ways, but uh, we um, as CCI really believe that uh, we should encourage DeFi protocols to be like the public permissionless blockchains. If they meet certain key features and um, it for us, it's five key features. You know, they decent is the DeFi protocol decentralized. I mean, I mean, we're talking about truly decentralized, um, and we include two critical tests um, in our paper on um, decentralization status. Is it autonomous? Is it truly non-permissioned? These there are if these protocols meet these features, and there I, I I'm sorry I cannot uh, at this very moment remember the last two. But these features then would make it a public good protocols. And if, if that's the case, then they would not have to be subject to regulation. But that's a very high bar to hit. And I can only count on like my one hand, actually, uh, the DeFi protocols. I can actually do that at this moment. But it is something that a regular fr regulatory framework could help encourage more protocols like those um, that I could count on my one hand. And the others, I would say they're permissioned. They're not, they're not permissionless protocols. Uh, those are, sorry, they're not decentralized protocols. Those are all mostly centralized protocols that are out there. So, so I find it fascinating and I would like to, I'm looking forward to reading the, the paper, but question, so how do you exclude 
the apps that we don't know where they're coming from. So let's let's take like Ethereum. It's pretty much permissionless, decentralized. How do you exclude a D app on Ethereum just because you don't know uh, where it's coming from? So in the paper, we do not go into how the regulators should exclude. But as a former regulator with, you know, personally, uh, it if you can set rules that say that permit what is legal and what's not legal, and if there are DApps and Congress decides this is not part of the ecosystem that we want for our digital economy, then they can, Congress can pass laws to prohibit um, such uh a known DApp. So it's, uh, it's really, that's a, it's a legal, this is actually a legal criminal question that you're, criminal law question that you're asking. And so. And just to maybe chime in here, um, like, I, I obviously would need to think more about it, but like, even if you like sort of had a list of, like a white list of addresses, Ethereum addresses that you could potentially, you know, potentially do transactions with, that, that could be one, there, 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 there probably are ways. And, and then, and then if that D app does a transaction with someone that is not on that white list, then that could raise flags. So it, it, there's, it, it's, it's a clunky way, but, but like just off the top of my head, like in a minute, <laughs> that's sort of what I came up with. But, but, but I, I, I think it, 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 um, I, I do think that there's, um, w and, and I think actually both of you have talked about, Mark definitely about like how we're in the early stages and it's a bit hard to envision where where things might be going or how they might evolve. I actually, Mark, I would love to get your thoughts. Yeah, I'm sitting here thinking about how confusing this all is. <laughs> Just to, to call a spade a spade, like I sit here and think about this all the time, and I, you know, I I come from a lens of traditional banking and and so on and so forth, and how those, you know, um, rules regulations can be enforced on the internet in a way that works in a distributed fashion, right? Um, and this is like a whole nother lens of like chaos of, of different permissions and, you know, innovations and rules and, you know, fraud vectors and so on and so forth. Like it is really complicated. And, you know, we're sitting up here, uh, you know, talking about some of these infrastructure pieces and how they're going to evolve. And, you know, time will tell. But I sit here and think about how do you, how do I explain this to my mom? or like my kids or <laughs> my family who, who doesn't sit here and think about this stuff the way that folks do in this room. Yeah. Um, like it is an extraordinarily hard problem, um, you know, and, and it's a global problem. Um, and, you know, thinking about all the ways that bad, bad actors or malicious, malicious actors can take advantage of people is like, scary um but i think if we fast forward 10 years 20 years 30 years a lot of noise will be like wrung out of the system um but it's just going to take a lot of time a new level of understanding like for congress to get their head around things or you know global legal systems to get their head around the right way to interact with this new economy new world new asset classes like it's just gonna it's it's really complicated <laughs> that, that, that's definitely an understatement mark <laughs> um so so kelvin i i well, one thing i've often found is that uh lawyers they, they, they're by nature that they're, they're paid to think about the world in the worst context <laughs> you, you always think about like what's going to go wrong how will it go wrong uh like you know so so Given what we, we, we've just talked about, like it seems like you're starting from a very low point <laughs> when, when looking at DeFi, and 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 is is there a way to level up uh, for, from some of this? Well, I, I think it's true that that lawyers okay basically tell people what could go wrong, how do we get around it, right? Um, and the problem for me really is uh, I see what the problems. Uh, that, that we have in ThreatFi, most of the frauds that we have, as I said, they target the end user. So, looking back 
on one Linda mentioned a little bit earlier about a Bitcoin blockchain not having been hacked. True, uh, there hasn't been a successful attack at the ledger, but how many people have lost their Bitcoins because they've been hacked? Right? Um, and it's next to impossible to recover these stolen Bitcoins because of the immutability inherent in the system. So I, I can understand if you're a libertarian, you don't want people interfering with how you manage your finances, but that would also mean you expose yourself to these bad actors and nobody can help you get your money back. Um, I don't think that's what most people want. I'm quite happy to, to try and find solutions. It's just that I wreck my brains and I can't think of any. So if, if you allow the system where you can recover, so it then becomes efficient somewhat. And what's the point? Then you're not just a centralized ledger. Uh, somebody has the power to freeze or, or reverse transactions. So everything a, a commission ledger can do, a centralized ledger with proper backups can do. That's a great point. And I, I also really liked, even in your... Um, how earlier you talked about like how sometimes uh, maybe a, a, the lowest transaction cost is not necessarily what is always desired. Like so, so there might be use cases where having a high transaction cost is uh, intentional. Um, let, let, let me go back to marriage. Uh, you, you know, think about how much you have to pay for a wedding, how how long of a problem it is. So if it was really easy to get married, that that would like change how one would look at um, at pairing up with someone so i and i not, not, not but so like just and i didn't mean to go off in a completely weird <laughs> also you also got to think about the exception costs what if you need to get unmarried yes, that is yes, also yes. very expensive yes. right yes so, so so i i i i wanted to get a little bit into like use cases and um you know i think we've talked about uh things in a very um abstract level but like at a you know very, uh, you know, concrete level, like, I, uh, Linda, are, like, are there any particular use cases that you are particularly uh, excited about for DeFi? Yes, so uh, the BIS innovation hubs around the world are conducting extremely interesting projects right now uh, looking at uh, pairing DeFi with central banks' systems. I am really looking forward to the day. There's only this is a personal story. I had been working in Basel, Switzerland, um, at the BIS, and uh, it was time to move back to Washington, and so I needed to move, you know, my savings uh, back to the U.S. I paid almost uh, over three thousand Swiss francs just for that transaction to send for myself to myself. Uh, just because it was uh, a cross-border transaction that had to go through correspondent banks. And and I also didn't get to profit from the, the FX spread either. You know, the banks that moved my money did. And so I look forward to the day when I can be able to send money uh, across uh, borders without having to pay uh, these crazy high bank fees and perhaps even getting a share of the FX spread. That is a, a personal um, uh, aspiration. And, uh, and I think uh, there are many people um, here in the U.S. who have families in other countries who uh, pay very high remitt remittance rates uh, to uh, uh, to just send money um, back to their um, uh, families and uh, and and friends in in their you know home countries and so it's I think it's a it's a real global issue and one that we really need to tackle and, and I'm heartened to hear Vice Chair Barr talk about. Uh, you know, Fed now coming online and also looking at the programmability of money. And, you know, the, the issue with Fed now is you have to have a bank account to, to benefit, um, from, uh, the services of Fed now. And, 
up to 20% of Americans today are either unbanked or underbanked. So Fed now will, would still not uh, um, be helpful to them. So I uh, really believe that be able to manage my own finances be able to send money directly to somebody that I want to send to money to is is very powerful, and I think that's like an immediate payments use case uh, that uh, is only one small part of of, of what uh, you know will be covered by DeFi. Mark, um, I think you've had the uh, uh, very very interesting. Uh, recent experience of, for example, even at a firm, like building something that was, and, and in, in, a, in a, with new data, new technologies, and having that applied in manners that you probably would not have expected when you first were building it. Um, are, are there any learnings from that that you, you can extend to, like, as far as like sort of the early days to, you know, what things might be used for? What are, what might be the use cases? Um, that we're not necessarily thinking about. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily have a, a specific example in mind to that. I think that there are like many terrible use cases you can point to, <laughs> um, and you know, there's you know maybe one percent of use cases that folks are still trying to figure out the best ways to apply these new technologies. And I think the more we can focus on the use cases and the capabilities that you know, a decentralized protocol or a dApp or whatever can provide to the world. I think it's better for the system as a whole because you can focus on that use case as opposed to the complexity under the hood. Um, you know, when I, I sit here and think about, um, you know, a, a firm is basically just an alternative payment method, right? It's a new way to pay for something and then you pay that back over time. Um, you know, with a firm, there's no late fees. There's no hidden interest, that sort of stuff. There's different variants of this. Um, but essentially, it's just a new way to get credit um, and and pay for that at the point of sale, right? Um, and, you know, I think more payment methods are a good thing. Um, you know, the thing I was sitting here thinking about after you said that is like, in, in you know, maybe passing it to, to Hannah over here, um, I'm I'm particularly intrigued about the new sorts of assets that can be created that are liquid and um, how that gives alternative ways for folks to create diversified portfolios in, in a way that helps their personal finance or businesses' financial experiences. But I also think about the flip side of that. The risks are often very complex and hidden and hard to explain. So um, that's what I say and think about. Yeah, but I think it's true for any new asset, right? So any new asset is is maybe attractive because it gives another outlet, uh, and especially valuable assets that uh, provide diversification opportunity. So they are not tightly tightly correlated with with other assets, and a lot of the a lot of crypto uh, is is this way, and any new asset um, has new. Um, New issues and uh, and new vulnerabilities that are not discovered until it's an old asset, uh, and maybe there may be needed new regulations or or customer protection uh, rules that are adjusted to this new asset. Uh, so so I think that in this in this context, then the question is, you know, is um, treat, treating um, crypto as new asset class uh, and providing some customer protection is it going to be uh, as possible or more difficult than uh, consumer protection for art uh, or for, uh, I keep going back to wine as, as an asset, uh, which are not regulated by financial markets regulators, right? But they are still, still some consumer protection. So that may be more difficult, maybe less difficult, maybe there, maybe there are already standing rules that we can use. But uh, it goes back to what Linda and her company is doing. Kelvin? And um, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, you know talking about um, you know use cases, um, you know I, I think the, uh, both uh, Mark and Hannah just talked about like investment and 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 uh, how DeFi uh, you know that some of these technologies could open up more opportunities there and and I think particularly in Asia like I, I I've seen you know like for example in Japan 
or Korea. Like, you know, th- there have been uh, countries where th- some of these t- um, asset classes have just taken off. Um, it, it, you know, any any thoughts around what you're seeing there? Or um, I, I, obviously, Singapore has been very uh, at the forefront. Uh, you know, with mass. Uh, you know, with, with like some of these technologies as well too. So uh, I think there was a lot, certainly a lot of excitement uh, in East Asia, not not just Japan, Korea, China as well. Uh, it was tremendously popular. Uh, but all that means, of course, is when it all imploded, uh, we got uh, the worst uh, all over the world. Um, I, I didn't want to mention something about uh, the example that Linda talked about, which was cross-border fund transfers. Now, uh, the reason why it is so expensive uh, is because you are not actually transferring an asset. Uh, what, what we call a, a, an interbank monetary transfer is not really a transfer in the property law sense of the word at all, because uh, what you have in a bank becomes simply a claim against a bank. And if the transferor's bank and the transferee's bank are, are two different banks, uh, then you start with one asset and you end with a different asset. And, and the reason why cross-border transfers are, are often so expensive is you need to find a common debtor in order for this to work. This is all the law of agency. This is not the law of property. And if the banking network of the transferee's uh, country and the transfer's country are, are not well integrated, then you would need more and more layers. And with the layers come risk because at every single point of the transaction, something could go wrong. And, and this is why the banks charge fees. And of course, banks are good for profit as well. Um, the only reason uh, you can get around this problem with crypto transfer is you get people to believe that this digital asset, this crypto asset has value. Now, clearly, some people believe in this uh, for some crypto assets, but they are still remarkably illiquid. Um, and I compare it some, okay, so people often push back and say, you know, what backs fear? It's, you know, it's just faith. But the difference is between a cult and a religion, I suppose. Uh, how, how many people have belief? I mean, money is widely accepted. US dollars is widely accepted. You can buy coffee pizza with it, Bitcoin a bit less so, uh, and altcoins even less so. So you need to find a transfer and transfer who has faith in the value of that asset, and then you can transfer that asset. And, and that's how, I suppose, crypto transfers beats out the um, fiat transfers. The problem there, of course, then you, you take the volatility of the asset. That's a problem. And of course, the lesser end user security because if you get hacked, no one can help you or very few people can help you. So those are the downsides. Uh, and so a lot of people go into this with eyes wide open. I don't have a problem with them, you know, taking the risk. Okay. And I, I think we're just at the end of the session. I, I, um, I really wanted to thank everyone um, for providing their thoughts. Um, this is obviously... A very complex topic, and you know we're still in the early days, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you, you all in the audience have more questions than answers, as, as do all of us, I think, as well. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Jalapa, for letting us. Uh,